I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Composed of a solid gold frame, standing 12 inches tall, set with 444 precious and semi-precious stones, including diamonds, rubies, sapphires, amethysts, garnets, and tourmalines, featuring an ermine-trimmed headband beneath a band of four fleur de lis a velvet cap encased by bejeweled arches which join at the top to support a central orb and cross. The crescendo of yesterday's coronation was when the Archbishop of Canterbury lowered St. Edward's crown onto King Charles's head, fashioned in 1661. It is, without a doubt, an old hat. <laughs> and some of you here, and certainly many people out there, feel like the whole thing is old hat, that it is outdated, that it is no longer fit for purpose. When John Flavel preached a sermon in the 17th century on the occasion of the coronations of their majesties King William and Queen Mary, he wrote that God would cleanse and wash the crown of England from all that guilt and pollution it has contracted under former governments, that the sins of the crown may not descend with it. He was, of course, principally concerned by the Roman Catholic profession of the previous wearer. But the point is that the crown stands as both a symbol for the glories of a nation and also its misdeeds and its sins. I know that in this church there are people whose ancestral homelands felt the indelicate touch of British imperialism, mine among them, whose lands were stripped of their precious resources to pad British purses and to furnish British crowns. We know that many people across this country, including some of us here, are struggling with the cost of living struggling to pay rent, to keep our families fed. A celebration costing over £100 million of public funds might feel rather out of touch when a fifth of the monarch's subjects are struggling in poverty. And we saw yesterday that the people who wanted to raise exactly these concerns through peaceful protest some of them were arrested before they had even raised a placard. If we should be proud of anything as a nation, it should be the fact that we have historically been quite good at welcoming dissent and difference. Whether we agree with the protesters or not, we should all be concerned about overreaching anti-protest laws, if for no other reason than because there will come a time when we wish to speak out, and we should not have to fear doing so. But for others, the descent of that old hat, that marvellously bejeweled crown, will have been a moment of grand celebration and rejoicing, a memory to treasure for life, the symbol of much of what is best about this great nation. I delighted as the king to whom I have sworn allegiance was crowned. In the same sermon I quoted earlier, Flavel also writes that God would make the crown sit easy and long upon his royal head, 
easy because crowns are usually lined with thorny cares and long for the church's peace and tranquility. We know that authority and power do not sit lightly, not least for a monarch who has to wear a five pound crown. They are both blessings and burdens. King Charles needs our prayers as he conducts his business of, as head of state, that he may be filled with the wisdom of God and matched with a holy heart. And he needs our prayers as he conducts his business as head and supreme governor of the church, that he may be inflamed with love for God and zeal for his glory. And finally, I want you to return your minds to the final stanza of that hymn that we just sang. Change from glory into glory Till in heaven we take our place Till we cast our crowns before thee Lost in wonder, love and praise In addition to our desire that God would cleanse the crown and cause it to sit lightly on King Charles's head, we also hope that our king may cheerfully take it off again and cast it at the feet of Jesus Christ, his king. In the book of Revelation, we're given a, a glimpse of worship in heaven, and it's that glimpse that Wesley weaves into that hymn. This is the passage. It says, Day and night without ceasing, the living creatures sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. They fall before Jesus and they throw down their crowns at his feet. Their earthly power, symbolized by their crowns, nothing in the face of his divine authority. And then they get up again and pick up their crowns and sit back down on their thrones. And we're told that they do this whenever the living creatures give glory. In the previous verse, we're told that the living creatures give glory day and night without ceasing. And so these elders are forever falling down in obeisance and casting down their crowns and picking their crowns back up and standing back up and sitting down in their thrones with their crowns back on. And then the living creatures give glory again. And once again, they throw themselves down on the floor and they cast their crowns to the feet of Jesus. And they stand back up and pick up their crowns and sit down in their thrones and then the living creatures give glory again and so they throw themselves once more on the floor, take their crowns and throw them at the feet of Jesus. Such is the lot for kings in the kingdom to come. May our king remember that the crown which he wears, the crown which affected his coronation yesterday, the crown which symbolises his earthly power, its best use is to be thrown before the throne of God, who is the King of Kings. Amen.